This video will attempt to take a look at environmental policy in the United States, focusing predominantly on what the federal government does and the major types of policies that it has enacted uh, over recent decades, and also taking a quick look at what states are doing uh, in, in the area of environmental policy as well. So let's start with the major categories of federal environmental policy. We're going to examine four basic areas that the government's involved in. One is something called an environmental impact statement. The second is environmental protection policy and pollution control. Those are a series of acts that Congress has enacted uh, predominantly in the uh, late 60s, early 1970s. Um, President Nixon had a hand in that natural resources policy, and finally, energy policy, uh, or what we'll see is more or less a lack of an energy policy. So first thing is uh, environmental impact statements. So this was passed in 1969 as the National Environmental Policy Act, and it's really the closest thing that we have to an environmental policy that covers everything in the United States. Essentially, it's a tool that helps in the procedure of any major capital projects that are going on in the United States. Uh, you can click through if you would like and take a look at various uh, environmental impact statements. Essentially, there are just various agencies uh, that are engaging in some type of prop, uh, project that may, um, that may influence the environment. And if that's the case, then they have to do an environmental study about the impacts and then allow that to be open for public comment. So if you click through and take a look at the one, uh, there's a, a specifically take a look at projects in Pennsylvania. There was one on the King of Prussia Railway project uh, that was done a couple of years ago where they assessed what type of damage that might do to the environment and allowed that to be open to the public for comment. Now, uh, this is, uh, when you take a look at where you need these EIS statements, essentially anything that quote unquote significantly affecting the quality of the human environment. Uh, and this is really policy analysis before they take action on any major project the federal government's involved in or using federal government money. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about this is it's necessary to undertake these environmental impact statements under the law. However, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that even if there's a harm on the environment that can't move forward with the project afterwards. Uh, but this type of thing can also be used by groups to, to you know, engage in lawsuits and various other things, studying the environmental damage that might come from something. Now, the important thing about this is, uh, this policy comes along in 1969. Uh, we've talked about iron triangles and the idea that there are congressional committees, interest groups, and executive agencies who make policy kind of out of the sight of the normal public realm. Uh, typically what happened, particularly in transportation uh, projects, as well as things on federal lands, were that federal agencies basically made decisions without uh, encountering any public input, and these took place out of sight. So one of the, the good things about the environmental impact statements is that they really kind of crack that iron triangle. And there has to be some uh, public comment. Uh, people are able to actually um, you know, assess what the reports say about environmental damage and challenge that if necessary. So this is one way that the public has been able to become part and parcel of the discussion about environmental impacts on things that the government pays for or is involved in. The second area of major environmental policies that the federal government's involved in is in either environmental protection policy or pollution control. And this is really a, a set of about seven major acts that you can see on the right hand side here. A very diverse set of policies that covers many different things. Most of these are related to something that poses some public health uh, risk to people. Uh, either through water or air uh, or some other type of um, chemicals or pollutants. So looking at all these major acts, you notice that there is a quite a bit of a, a kind of trend there 
that almost all of these were enacted in the 1970s, uh, so one in the late 1960s and the Superfund in 1980. But these acts, uh, that was a, a point in time in which we were seriously involved in, and interested in the environment in the United States. Since then, there have been revisions to these acts, but these were the major acts when they were instituted. So we had the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, um, basically uh, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, which covered hazard, hazardous waste and solid waste, um, covering commercial chemicals, uh, insecticide, fungicide, and rodenticide act of 1972. Uh, and then finally, uh, what became known as the Superfund Act, which was passed in 1980. Uh, and essentially the Superfund is uh, out there to help clean up toxic waste sites that are around the country and pose uh, a hazard to people. And remember, uh, back to this idea of focusing events and what gets people to pass public policy, that was the result of some serious toxic waste issues in a place called, uh, in upstate New York called Love Canal, and that really spurred uh, action on the Superfund sites. Now, when we're talking about all these, we're talking about uh, diverse regulatory actions, many of them taken by the Environmental Protection Agency. They touch pretty much every aspect of uh, industrial and commercial enterprise in the United States and really affect us as ordinary citizens. Uh, basically, it influences our air, our food, water, um, cars, consumer products. Um, you know, it, it goes to the core of, you know, what type of uh, mileage our, get, our cars should get um, and has really had a profound effect on the environment. While we oftentimes uh, hear kind of, you know, environmental regulation slipping, uh, the results of these acts have uh, substantially improved the environment in the United States. One way to focus on these is the Environmental Protection Agency has traditionally used uh, um, a, a method of action called command and control. Uh, and that is essentially whereby the federal government sets certain environmental regulations in place and then enforces those against usually companies. Now, when we look at the EPA, this is what's really interesting about environmental regulation. This is one area in which Congress gives pretty wide latitude to an administrative agency to be able to make the rules. Um, the science behind this is not something that Congress or ordinary members of Congress uh, are, are really able to decide on. So they create outlines of what we should do in order to be able to protect the environment. And then the EPA uh, sets up those environmental standards. One of the things that we look at uh, with the EPA is they take a look at um, you know, how much cost implementation is going to, to wreak on, on the American public. So that kind of cost benefit analysis is also part of this. Uh, is it worth it to do something about the environment if there's say a uh, very low benefit for the American public and very high costs? Those types of things enter into their decision making and again, when we think about this, uh, it's pretty much impossible to eliminate all risk when we take a look at the environment. Uh, but the, the goal of the EPA through these environmental protection and pollution control acts is essentially to be able to get it to a manageable level where it doesn't post, uh, uh, pose any problems to, to human or biological health. The third area in which the federal government's involved in is natural resource policies. Um, and these are essentially policies that govern public lands, forests, and parks. Um, and mostly these are uh, carried out by two specific agencies, the Department of the Interior, which includes things like the National Park Service, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Land Management, and then secondarily, the Department of Agriculture, which um, deals mostly with the Forest Service, uh, but also with soil conservation as well. In thinking about that, what's interesting is, this is one of those things where 
think in the East Coast, we don't have as much tension between the federal government and, uh, and the states and the local governments when it comes towards federal loans. But if you take a look at the Western part of the United States, you'll see an enormous amount of land is owned by the federal government. Upwards of 90% of the state of Nevada is owned by the federal government. Uh, and a lot of these other states like Utah, you're looking at you know, 60, 70%. And essentially, a lot of this was that as we moved west, there was a lot of land that was deemed to be undesirable. Um, if you've ever been uh, in Nevada, you know, a great part of Nevada is, is basically just desert. So um, there, there wasn't really any um, impetus for people to settle there, and that remained in, uh, in, in, in the public domain. Uh, if you take a look at you know, states like Pennsylvania and New York, most of our states uh, the federal government didn't have much control over because we, we came in as, as independent states uh, after the revolution. Um, we don't have a lot of national parks. We do have a lot of national parks when it comes to things like, say, Independence Hall or Gettysburg or various other historical sites in Pennsylvania. Uh, but for the most part, that doesn't influence public policy. This influences the daily lives of many people that live in the West. So just to give you an example, uh, this is uh, the federal lands that are in the area uh, that is predominantly around Yellowstone National Park. So uh, the, the middle bottom state there is Wyoming and Montana's on top of that, and then uh, Idaho on the extreme left. And if you take a look at the upper right hand corner, upper left hand corner of Wyoming, what you'll see is that it's uh, essentially Yellowstone, and below that is Grand Teton, which is also a national park. But there are also a bunch of other areas around there that are part of what is called the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, which is administered mostly by the federal government. As you can see, all of these different types of, um, of agencies control these lands, and they make decisions about these public lands that influence the economic development around there how much access can be there, how much mining can be there, uh, whether or not cattle and other livestock can be grazing on those. These are all things that are very important to the economics of these areas and cause a lot of conflict oftentimes between uh, people that are trying to make their living off the land versus environmentalists. Um, a funny thing, I, just to go back here for a second, um, I was once uh, at a meeting of the Western Governors Association, which uh, is in Denver, and uh, we were talking there, and and uh, basically the, the gentleman that was running this was, the discussion was saying, you know, the, the East Coast historically has messed up our environment entirely, and they feel the need to basically tell us, who have been conserving our resources for hundreds of years, how to do what they couldn't do on their own. And there's a real kind of Washington versus uh, the West feeling, uh, which comes out in the politics, a lot of what goes on in the West. So some of these things on natural resource policies, uh, basically the idea of multiple use uh, has been what these agencies look at. Uh, how can we deal with the idea of this competing economic development versus environmental preservation. Uh, and oftentimes what you'll see is this can be a, a serious kind of partisan issue with Republicans oftentimes on the side of economic development uh, and more progressive Democrats being on the side of environmental preservation. There's been a number of kind of big um, you know, problems recently uh, dealing with, um, you know, some of the resource, national resource policies, um, you know, for, you know, the last couple of centuries, um, many people have been using federal lands to graze their cattle on, um, and the government charges, you know, nominal fees on this. Uh, but recently, you know, cattle, for whatever reason, part of their, their hoof, <laughs> Is, um, is very different than say, for example, a buffalo. And it, it creates a different, while well, buffalo historically roamed over the west coast of the United States and pretty much the whole country, 
somehow something about their hoof is different in the way that it aerates the soil whereby cattle have more do more damage and uh, environmentalists have been trying to stop federal grazing uh, and this has caused a lot of conflict again that balance between economic development and environmental preservation uh, snowmobiling in Yellowstone National Park was stopped for a while under the Clinton administration essentially because of the pollution related to that but also the fact that uh, as you can see in this picture down in the right hand corner um, it was um, scaring the buffalo and various other wildlife that were still there um, but again this is if you take a look at all these people that live around Yellowstone National Park in Idaho and Montana and, and Wyoming itself uh, they rely on people coming in the winter doing these activities uh, for some of their economic development so that it's things against each other uh, another area that's interesting since we're sticking with this idea, you know, the idea of Yellowstone National Park was back in the late uh, 1980s, early 1990s, um, wolves had been hunted almost to extinction in the lower 48 states. Um, and we had um, a policy in Yellowstone National Park to reinstitute wolves, uh, reintroduce them into Yellowstone National Park. And, um, you know, it's been very successful. But one of the problems associated with that was that uh, people that own cattle farms near Yellowstone National Park um, were concerned about the wolves getting in there and killing uh, their livestock because, you know, there's, there's no kind of fence around Yellowstone National Park. So uh, that turned into a controversy. And eventually what has happened with that is there's been funding set up in order to be able to compensate uh, people that have cattle ranches and have had their cattle killed by wolves. But again, this is this this whole idea of how do we use these resources? Uh, should we keep them pristine and should we not allow a whole lot of access to these areas to allow them to be, you know, in the environmental state that they originally were? How much economic development? These are all types of things that these agencies are tasked with uh, trying to balance out. Um, a couple of examples here. I, I, I did mention some of this, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on this. But uh, you know, the Endangered Species Act is is an example of natural resource policies. Uh, so if you flip through here, that came out in 1973. Again, you know, thinking in terms of these policies, you take a look at about 1,500 uh, species are on the endangered list in the United States. So. Let's take a look at uh, threatened and endangered animals in the U.S. These are an enormous array of things. So let's take a look at uh, vertebrate animals. So we've got the Alabama cave fish. Uh, we've got the Apache trout. We've got the Barton Springs salamander. If you remember the uh, the darter, the snail darter from earlier on, we have a bayou darter uh, that is also uh, endangered. The blue tail mole skink, uh, the bog turtle, and so on and so forth. Uh, take a look at some of the invertebrate animals. Uh, these are uh, you know not something most of us would be very uh, you know associated with, but uh, the Alabama lamp mussel. Uh, the Appalachian elk toe, uh, the big sandy crawfish. Uh, there's some kind of pig fish that I saw down here earlier uh, that was interesting as well. So you get the idea. Um, there are, oh, the Cumberland pig toe and the Cumberland monkey face pearly mussel. Uh, so all these things uh, are on our endangered species list. Um, and oftentimes if you find that animal on certain lands, uh, there will be regulations put in place. Finally here, just like to take a look at energy policy in the United States. Uh, we don't have any real coherent energy policy. Uh, most of what we've seen over the course of our history has been a focus on oil and coal uh, and really kind of keeping gas cheap in the United States. Uh, in recent decades, uh, especially in the last decade, natural gas has been much more of an issue. Government uh, doesn't have one big comprehensive 
energy policy in the United States. We have a series of things that deal with regulation, public education, tax credits, uh, and subsidies for research and development uh, that affect this. Uh, just to give a couple of examples of how this would work. Um, for example, uh, it, when it comes to regulation, you might notice that when you pull up to your gas pump, it oftentimes says you know, that there's a certain amount of ethanol that's part of your uh, gas. And this is really kind of something that occurred back and started in the 1970s, it's been popular since then. And that is that um, we've, we've started to use around about 10% of all of your gasoline is constructed of ethanol, which is made from corn in the United States. And uh, some cynical people believe that the only reason this is around is because Iowa is a huge producer of corn. And Iowa, as you know, is the first caucus in the presidential primary. So everybody kind of kowtows to the farmers there. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. However, um, that's part of the regulation. In order to be able to be less reliant uh, on foreign oil, that, that policy was passed uh, before. Tax credits, um, you know, in Pennsylvania, to give you an example, under the Corbett administration and now extended into the Wolf administration, uh, the Pennsylvania government is offering $1.6 billion to Shell, uh, the oil company, to build a ethane cracker in Western Pennsylvania in Beaver County, which is uh, just a little bit north, uh, northwest of Allegheny County where Pittsburgh lies right on the Ohio border. And the idea is this will create 6,000 new jobs. In the process of doing this, essentially what this does is it takes some of the byproducts of natural gas and turns them into things like plastics. So that creates a whole new industry based on natural gas in Pennsylvania. Uh, but again, that's you know, encouraging development in the area of energy policy and the move towards natural gas. Just so you can see here, um, this is the overall energy consumption in the United States. And what you'll see is that gasoline or petroleum, as we would call it, uh, accounts for about a third of all our energy consumption. Now, if I had a comparative uh, slide here, natural gas is now 31%, uh, and almost a third. Um, since the advent of hydraulic fracturing uh, and, and making this cheaper really over the last, it's been around for over 100 years, but um, the ability to be able to do not just uh, vertical, but also horizontal um, fracking, meaning that you can go down and then over We've had vertical fracking for a long time, but the ability to, to do it horizontally has really allowed us to open up a massive uh, uh, shale um, development, uh, particularly here in Pennsylvania. We're one of the biggest natural gas producers outside of Texas. We're number two in the country. And um, the Marcellus Shale, which runs through Pennsylvania, um, is, is, a, is a, a boom for natural gas extraction. At the same time, we've seen that because natural gas is relatively cheap vis-a-vis -vis mining coal, coal has declined severely over recent decades. So if you take a look here at the chart down at the bottom, uh, coal is the, the deep blue at the bottom. And you can see that it's declined almost to an insignificant amount of our power consumption here in the United States, whereby natural gas has uh, really exploded in recent decades um, as well. Uh, and about 11% of, um, of our power comes from, from renewable energy. Let's take a quick look here at federalism and the environment and just in, in terms of the um, states for the most part. Uh, we've had very much difficulty in being able to do any type of serious environmental le uh, legislation at the federal level in recent years, whether it be energy policy, whether it be some sort of cap and trade or carbon tax to deal with global warming. Um, and what we've seen is that the states, for the most part, have been taking the lead, at least some of them have. And 
we can basically call environmental policy, uh, the term comes from Martha Derthick, it's compensatory federalism. And she defines that as being whereby Washington proves hesitant, uncertain, distracted, and in disagreement about what to do with states responding with a step into the breach. In other words, in the absence of federal action, states have taken uh, action here. And what we'll see is that oftentimes these are what we would call blue states or democratic states, but that's not always the case. Um, you know, there's action being taken in most states where there's federal inaction, states are taking the lead. So for what we see is that states for the most part offer a lot of things like economic incentives um, and effort to be able to encourage green development of some sort. So um, in Iowa, uh, they did not tax anything dealing with uh, construction or purchase of pollution control equipment as a way to spur, uh, you know, retrofitting of plants. Um, Maryland and many other states actually uh, also offer incentives for people to get alternative fuel vehicles um, in an effort to cut down on waste products. Uh, what we're seeing is that um, many people, uh, many municipalities and states are taxing solid waste so that people produce less, less solid waste. So it's a, a, the tax serves as a disincentive um, to, to create as much waste. Uh, and then we also see things like taxes on beverage containers or deposits that need to be there. So if you ever see, you know, a can or a bottle on, you know, you can take it to Michigan and get 10 cents back. Uh, the idea is to encourage recycling uh, through those projects. I uh, mentioned the idea that we haven't really been able to come up with any type of a plan to deal with uh, carbon emissions in the U.S., any comprehensive uh, cutbacks, uh, like a cap and trade program. Um, we do have in the northeastern part of the United States, which call something called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, and this is 10 states that have created a market to cut down on environmental uh, pollution uh, and carbon. And Pennsylvania is in the process of joining that. Uh, New Jersey uh, withdrew from it uh, years ago in the Christie administration, but now is moving back in. So these states have essentially decided to uh, bond together in the Northeast uh, and create their own kind of market to cut down on the amount of carbon emissions. It's a very complicated system, so I'm not gonna get involved too much into it, uh, but just know that you know, this type of cooperation is going on among different states. Uh, we're talking about renewable energy. Uh, if you take a look here, uh, this is from the National Conference of State Legislatures. Uh, we do see that most states around the country have some sort of renewable portfolio standards uh, or some kind of voluntary target. Um, and Pennsylvania is one of them. Um, California aims to get, I think by 2024, almost 40% of its power uh, from renewable resources, which is probably gonna be a really tough target to hit. Um, then you also see uh, that there are states predominantly in the South uh, that have no targets um, for trying to get renewable energy. So what are the limits on states? Um, you know, one of the problems is that uh, economic development and extra, externalities come into play, right? So um, some states view creating new green power as a source of economic development, um, and other states don't view that. Um, the other thing is that, you know, if one state uh, helps to create a more, uh, you know, clean environment, that doesn't mean that pollution from other areas of the country don't come in, those externalities. Uh, one of the problems that we have with having states taking control over environmental policy is that uh, there's very uneven state performance. We saw you know, here back in this map that there are certain states that just aren't willing uh, to, for whatever reason, sometimes because they create these dirty power things like coal, um, that they aren't willing to create environmental policies themselves. So some are really forward looking when it comes to environmental policy like California, and some don't have any at all. Um, and then finally, um, you know, 
they need to rely on the federal government uh, really for money for this. Um, the EPA uh, really creates regulations and does research, um, but leaves most of the administration or the um, implementation of these laws to the states. Uh, so this is also kind of one of those federal partnerships uh, where we see cooperation between state uh, and, and the national government. So states, while they can do things, uh, don't have the same amount of impact that federal policy over this would be, again, because of this idea of externalities. And that is an overview of environmental policies in the United States.